Okay. Hello, my name is Jim McGregor. I'm uh, the founder and principal analyst at Turius Research. Thank you for joining our hangout today. Today we're here to talk about uh, shared purposes and uh, our shared purpose in the collaborative business ecosystem. Uh, I am thankful today to be joined by three very distinguished fellows. The first one is the author of a book called Shared Purpose, uh, a Thousand Business Ecosystems, a worldwide connected community in the future of the future and the future. Um, that is actually available on the ARM website. If you go to www.arm and type in shared purpose, it will bring up that PDF file for you. Um, Mr. Moore uh, has conducted research and taught at Harvard Business School, Stanford Program on Organizations, and the Darden School, University of Virginia. He's basically an expert on leadership and change in large-scale systems. Uh, second off, I have, uh, welcome Jim, uh, or James. And uh, second, I have Simon Seegers. He has been at ARM since um, 1991, was appointed to the board in 2005, and if you haven't heard, as of July of 2013, he is now the CEO of ARM Holdings. Welcome. Hi, Jim. How are you doing? Thank you. Good. Uh, and finally, we have Jeff Lees. Jeff is a Senior Vice President, General Manager of Microcontrollers at Freescale. Jeff has over 30 years experience around microcontrollers and actually has also held senior level positions at NXP and Philips. So thank you for joining us, Jeff. Good morning, Jim. Gentlemen, we're here to talk about collaborative ecosystems. Uh, first thing I want to do is kind of start off with, um, with uh, James. James, you wrote this book or this paper, mm -hmm. however you want to refer to it. You know, when you talk about three different types of business ecosystems, kind of three generations, the first one being kind of monopolies, the second one being collaborative, and now this third one that's kind of a combination of the two. Can you kind of give us more of a feeling of, you know, what that really means? Um, sure, I can. It's, um, thank you, first of all, and welcome. Uh, it's really nice to be here. It's my first Google Hangout, and uh, it's going to be really interesting. The... Um, uh, my my career starts uh, uh, more than 20 years ago, uh, studying very large scale systems. And the, the first generation that I studied were these large systems, these large monopolistic systems, um, the Intel's, the AT&T's. Um, AT&T was a, a client and a friend of mine for over 15 years. Uh, I was very involved with Intel and uh, a number of other firms. And at the time, I was very excited because these firms could put a lot of capital to work. They could focus very intently on, on creating these just powerful innovation trajectories. And they could, um, they could, they could use the money that they made from their, uh, from their monopoly positions to orchestrate these large business ecosystems and get the whole community to evolve together. So I found that exciting, and I wrote a lot about it. Um, then about... Uh, 10 or 15 years ago, a change happened. The open source community began to emerge. And in some ways, it, it emerged as a reaction uh, to that. And, and I began to get very intrigued by those communities. They had a very different notion of property rights. They didn't really believe in property rights generally. Uh, they came out of the academic world. They believed in sharing knowledge. And they had this um, uh, powerful ability to proliferate ideas and this this, this powerful business model that combined education uh, with implementation. And, uh, and, 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 and I watched as that grew and grew and grew and grew and grew and, and initially threatened the big monopolies. Uh, they then eventually began to see that they could invest in them in some sense to do in their, uh, their counterparts. Uh, but uh, it, this thing just kept growing and growing and growing. And then, uh, but it had a limit. And, and the limit was it couldn't put to work uh, large amounts of capital. It, it, you could do software that way very easily. It was very, very difficult to do hardware that way, and it was virtually impossible to do semiconductors that way. Uh, now, what I've seen now uh, is, uh, is a third generation, and I'm now sort of living in that third generation, and it's able to do two things beautifully. It's able to, number one, put capital to work. So you have the, the TSMCs, uh, you have uh, Global Foundries, uh, Samsung, uh, you know, the IBM common platform effort. Uh, these are ways to focus uh, attention, energy, capital, and, and build capabilities for the system. Uh, by the same token, these, these systems are very, very open and inclusive. So virtually anyone can come in. 
Uh, companies like ARM will facilitate relationships among players. Uh, and what's being built is a, um, a resource, really, that has both qualities to it. It has the goodwill, the knowledge, the software, the relationships of the open source community, and it has the ability to, uh, to put capital into the ground of the bigger monopolies. And the combination is just, uh, uh, to me, seems, at, at the current moment at least, unbeatable. And we can, you know, we can see where that goes next. But at but the current moment, it's, it's really quite impressive. Well, as, as we look at this, you know, obviously ARM has kind of been a pioneer here. They started as a small company, built a really collaborative ecosystem. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess my next question really is to Jeff, you know, as you looked at all this, and obviously Freescale's worked with a lot of different technology companies um, over the years. As a matter of fact, I used to work at Motorola, so I've seen a lot of those companies. Um, why did Freescale choose ARM? Well, I guess if you, you look back far enough to the evolution of the uh, PDA mobile platform, you'll see that uh, we migrated to ARM quite early in, in that. Um, a lot of that had to do with um, customer market demand. I think you were seeing the beginning of the origin of a, an ecosystem there where the idea of software and systems availability on a common platform made a lot more sense than a closed system. Well, and uh, I, I just want to remind all the people we have on the Hangout, if you want to ask questions over uh, Twitter, you can go ahead and type in hashtag arm shared purpose and go ahead and ask questions, and I'll take those in a few minutes. But moving on, you know, let's talk a little bit more how this really evolved. Uh, Simon, can you kind of give us a feel, you know, was this out of necessity? And as we look forward, you know, and you're trying to give lessons learned to other small companies as, as they start out, how can you really build this collaborative ecosystem? around a small company, around its products, around its services? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was really out of necessity. Um, it was interesting, Jim was talking about large companies having lots of capital to go and put to work. Um, when Arm started out, we were a very small company, and we had almost no capital to put to work. Uh, <laughs> and what we had was being spent on, uh, you know, uh, tea, coffee, desks, and computers. Uh, um, so as a small company, uh, in trying to uh, establish a technology um, in a, in a huge industry that up to that point had been dominated by enormous companies with, with massive uh, capital structures, um, we did have to take a different approach. Um, and it was pretty clear from day one that there was no way on earth ARM could do everything. So we had to go and uh, develop this ecosystem of partners to provide the additional support that people needed to actually use a microprocessor uh, and embed it into a chip. Um, and write software for it and uh, run operating systems and so on and so on. Um, you know, it would have been, would have been uh, one level quite great if, if ARM could have done everything and profited from everything anybody ever needed to build SOCs. Uh, but that was obviously not going to happen. Um, and since we wanted to build a very efficient company, we wanted to uh, proliferate our technology, we wanted to enable um, innovation. Uh, then it became vital that there was a, a strong ecosystem of partners that, that were supporting what we were doing. So, you know, that started small. Um, when your technology is not being used by very many people, uh, it's kind of hard to convince others uh, to, to do uh, work, you know, without paying for it uh, that supports your technology. Um, but as the adoption of, of ARM technology grew, uh, that became much easier and people saw that there was a market uh, in which they could sell their products. And as this all evolved, uh, you know, where we are today is a large network of companies who, through their own business models, uh, can have profitable businesses uh, supporting what has become a, a very widely used uh, standard architecture. Um, and it's proven to be a, a real strength of the technology. The, the, the effect of that for anybody wanting to use an ARM processor or an ARM product means that the cost of doing so has, has become lower. And that, again, has helped drive innovation because people can spend money instead of reinventing the wheel all the time, um, actually doing something that's truly going to differentiate their own product. So we think the effect of it's been very good, but it was a necessity for all. Well, you know, it is amazing because over the years I've seen numerous different processor architectures fail. So seeing ARM survive and proliferate so significantly. But, you know, as we look forward, you know, and not just for you know, processors, but also for software, you know, maybe even outside the technology arena 
and this is a question to all the participants, are there certain products, and this actually comes off the web, a uh, question off the web, are there certain products or services that are better suited for this? And, you know, can you give kind of an idea of how to get that collaborative process started? James, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, I, um, well, let me, let me take one that's, that's in some sense far afield, is healthcare. Uh, if, if you look at what people are trying to do with healthcare reform today and with uh, the transformation of healthcare, uh, a huge part of that is behavioral. A huge part of that is changing people's behavior, changing people's view of what health is. Um, also, a, a very large part of that is getting the uh, um, kind of the associated complementary industries to work together, like like uh, nutrition, like uh, um, uh, you know fast food places, for example. And so, as you as you as we think about how to change healthcare, um, clearly there's this this proliferation of ideas challenge. There's there's a community building challenge, and that's very hard for uh, conventional companies to do. And and what I'm starting to see in healthcare is uh, uh, traditional community organizers. There's a fellow Marshall Gantz who's at the Kennedy School at Harvard, who worked on Obama's campaign. He now has a group working on healthcare at uh, at a number of locations across the United States. And what they're trying to do is create essentially open source like communities where people are fixing healthcare and then link them into the deep technology companies, the GEs and so forth. Uh, and, and indeed, uh, you, uh, ARM partner uh, Qualcomm is very active in this uh, to, to, to collectively uh, change that business. And, um, and, and I think the key to all that is, is the kind of goodwill that gets established and has to be continually uh, continually reinforced, a, a willingness of people to share, a willingness to help them. Uh, uh, Jeff, when I, when I spoke with Jeff, Jeff was one of my favorite people in the, in the book here. He was my, one of, I would call him a prime informant from the standpoint of a social science researcher. And, um, you, know, you know, Jeff talked about how, uh, from his standpoint, he gives a lot of, of technology advice and a lot of wisdom and a lot of uh, insight to ARM free. And he said, you know, why would I do that? Well, why I do that is because it comes back to me, and it comes back to the community, and we all can benefit. Well, it's that spirit, that intangible spirit that I think is, uh, is, is one of the inventions, if you will. It's one of the things that ARM is, and its partners are good at. It's not just ARM. It's, you know, 900,000 partners. It's a culture. Well, if you can fix health care, that's, that's quite an achievement. <laughs> Well, let me put it this way: it won't be fixed uh, without something like that. I don't know if we can fix it. But. Okay. Well, and, and I think so. Building on that, you know, there are some big issues that the world faces. You know, healthcare is an issue not just in the U.S. but the world over. Um, education. Um, you yeah. know, dealing with uh, managing energy and constrained energy supplies. Dealing with managing uh, water. You know, usage around the world as as um, you know, the kind of foods people want to eat become more expensive to to uh, develop and harvest and distribute. Um, you know, these are big issues that no one person is going to solve on their own. There are some technology solutions that help, uh, but I think taking as open a model as possible um, on the, these big kind of uh, global issues is going to be the way people do it. Um, you know, you can't rely on a few people to innovate around you know such enormous problems. So, you know, why not try and utilize as many brains as you possibly can uh, by creating open platforms, creating an environment in which people can profit from the work that they do uh, and share the results. It becomes very self-supporting. Uh, you bring up the word profit. You know, uh, matter of fact, in James's book, he, a lot of the companies he talked to and used his examples, they were public companies. So, I mean, that brings up a really big question, you know, especially for Jeff and for Simon. You know, how do you maximize profit in this collaborative ecosystem? I mean, it kind of goes against the way that we've normally, you know, business 101. You build a business, you maximize profits, and you try to become the biggest, most powerful company in, in, in the playing field. So, how do you do that? So, that's an existing paradigm, and, and I get asked it a lot, is how do you differentiate in an open partnership system? I think we don't take enough into account of the acceleration effect. So the uh, the speed with which we can uh, create new models and new markets, bring technology to bear, it's uh, an order of magnitude faster in an open platform. 
and with readily shared IP. The, the reuse impact for us is, is just truly enormous. Yeah, absolutely. I, think I mean, you know, Jeff, you used to have you know many different uh, architectures available to you. Well, you you still do, but uh, um, I imagine that you get most return on the products that you sell based on everything that you wrap around those processes, as opposed to the processor itself. Yet principally, the, principally because of that speed. So yeah. the the speed with which we can integrate not just the the cores and fabrics, but uh, new specialized IP. Um, it changes the, the make-buy equation, and it, it gives us the opportunity to maybe look at, you know, we, we wouldn't have had the bandwidth to approach so many fronts at the same time. So I, I think it, it creates new opportunity, and out of that, you know, profit takes care of itself if, if you gain first-mover advantage and, uh, you know, just drive a market hard. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a trade-off to make around making the playing field as big as possible. You know, it's, it's a trade-off between size of pie and how much pie you want to have. Um, and I think the, the open approach uh, creates e you know, enormous business opportunities and uh, you know, there, there's room for lots of people to come profit on that, as long as you differentiate your, your end product. Well, and that's, you know, I, I think that Wall Street still kind of cringes when they hear you say that, but it really is true. You know, we've seen that you know, in technology in the past, whenever you enable the market, everyone benefits. But it seems like, you know, inevitably in every technology segment, we end up going down this road where you have companies fall out. And you end up with a couple of very large companies, monopolies, duopolies, whatever. Um, you know, how do we, you know, and, and first off, is that, James, this is for you, is that a natural market evolution? And if it is, for the rest of you, how do we avoid that? How do we continue as these markets evolve and mature to continue to promote collaboration and open environments? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, this I I love this question, and it's it's um, and, and I I, I want to go back to, uh, to 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 Jeff in a minute because Jeff Jeff told me some stories that are just you know a, a, amazing about the cost savings that he gets by not working on multiple platforms and his ability to redeploy that engineering talent to do differentiated things on top of those platforms. And so, you know, that clearly is the model, is that you're, you're trying to build differentiated offerings on top of shared, uh, shared and reused uh, technology and then change the role faster and faster and faster. And that's really where wealth ultimately comes from. Uh, but you go back to this thing about is it, is it natural for one company to dominate things? Um, I, I think it's natural for uh, particular solutions to become shared solutions. Uh, uh, if they, their solutions build in a way that encourages differentiation on top of them. So I think it's, it's natural the ARM instruction set has become uh, something shared by a very, very large community. Um, it's, it's clear that, to me at least, that if, that if ARM wanted to, temporarily they could raise their, raise their prices a lot and kind of you know, put the screws down and extract more value in their position. Uh, but, but the entire system depends on the openness of people like Jeff and others uh, to continue to feed knowledge back and forth uh, you know, to make that grow. Um, now to directly answer your question, sure, we see uh, large tech companies, um, you know, the, the, the Cisco, was the Intels, the Microsofts and so forth, the Oracles, and they do extract very, very large profits. Um, what, what I would argue is that um, while they're extracting those profits, they're, 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 they're rigidifying the overall ecosystem. They're rigidifying the market. And it, it, it used to be that didn't matter because the world didn't change that much. Uh, so you could have the same relational database for a long time. Or the PC industry is a great example. The, the current PC is still basically the PC of, of, of 10 years ago. It just has a different form. You know, it comes small, medium, and large, essentially. Uh, that's... that's um, that's an amazing, I, I would say, artificial rigidifying uh, that, that, that was placed on that market uh, in order to extract profit out of it. And, and, and I, think that, I think it's not actually natural for these rigidities to happen. They happen because people work to do it. And we may need to change things like, um, like, like patent law to allow more entrance. And, and we do need to think about ways to avoid artificial barriers to entry in these markets. But um, uh, you know, I don't think that's just natural. And then, and then finally, and I'll get off. But, but finally, 
uh, whenever you've got an open model versus a closed model, or, or I should say a hybrid model like this one, versus a closed model, I think then you see Jeff's effect, which is this rapid innovation, erodes very, you know, in, in business terms, very rapidly, erodes the closed system. So you're seeing that today, I think, in the PC world. Uh, it, yeah, there's still a couple of players are still pulling a lot of profits out of it. A bunch of other players are, are really uh, running out of gas. And, uh, and overall, the customer doesn't much like what they have. Uh, very, very big contrast to what's happening in the smartphone arena and, and ultimately what will happen in the Internet of Things as well. And I think you've seen a, a certain rigidity in the um, embedded markets over the last years in the sense that e each architecture, each uh, ecosystem was its own closed area. And if anything, that, that held back the early Internet of Things. But, uh, but as we see that accelerating now, it's quite clear that the, the open system, at least the, uh, the ARM open system, is just making the connectivity between those pieces, hmm. uh, allowing those embedded devices, which uh, for the past 10, 15 years have been pretty much standalone, to be much, much more part of the network. And it, it's that move to the network and the ease yeah, of yeah. Uh, developing on the ecosystem that is really fueling this amazing rise now in the Internet of Things. Yeah, I, I think the Internet of Things and the openness of it he is the key to IoT becoming a really useful technology. I mean, you, you look at the internet itself, uh, and I've said this a few times now, you know, it, it was designed to create, you know, resilient uh, communications networks in the event of a nuclear war. It was not designed to um, create, you know, massive e-commerce uh, businesses like uh, Amazon and Google. Um, but fortunately, it's built around open standards and it's easy to connect to it. Um, and, you know, huge businesses that nobody was thinking of uh, when the internet was created have happened as a result. Now today when we look at uh, the internet of things, um, they're closed systems. You know, in the main, people are building closed systems. I think if we can crack making that open, and that, um, uh, that, that requires us to address security issues and privacy issues and, and lots of things. Um, but I think, I think it's important that we do work on solving those issues so the Internet of Things can become a much more open system. And then, you know, once all of the, the infrastructure is in place, who knows what somebody else is going to think up to do with it. Um, I think the Internet is a great example of that. I think the way that uh, uh, smartphones are open platforms, the way there's an infrastructure to allow app developers to monetize their work, you know, that has led to um, innovations that were not in the mind of the guy that built the smartphone, weren't in the mind of you know the guy that us that, that designed the microprocessor, the guy that built the SOC, just weren't in the minds of anyone. But the openness has allowed other people to go and innovate on top of this platform, and it's created you know phenomenal applications. Well, since the Internet of Things seems to be a hot topic these days, Jeff, can you give us an example of how you know, working with ARM, the ARM ecosystem as a whole, is really enabling Freescale to go after the Internet of Things and capture the minds of what people can do with that? Yeah, as I said earlier, it, it's the acceleration effect. It's um, When you think about our embedded industry, we've been shipping about, on average, 10 billion units of microcontroller embedded processor a year. On average, today it's up in the 15 to 18 billion range per year, the vast majority of which were not interconnected. So in, in the recent um, design win and uh, customer engagements, we see far, far, more, far, far more now a, a, an inclusion of connectivity, multiple connectivity standards. And it's those uh, software stacks and connectivity um, technologies that are really driving the move towards a standard open platform. No company can develop that level of uh, connectivity, capability, interoperability, certification, based on closed standards. It, it's beyond the ability of any one company to, to cover that spectrum. So it's just enabling us to look at everything from edge node devices, how we get the right power and performance and cost level in edge node, right through to various gateway boxes, all the way through to the internet backbone through networking equipment. It, it allows Freescale to basically address all of those spaces where at one time maybe we, we would have just had to say which one can we play in and which one can we win in. Well, you mentioned standards, Jeff, and that's a very good point. So, I mean, how open should platforms be? You know, uh, what should be standardized, what shouldn't be standardized? Mm. 
Simon mentioned security, and I think that's that's probably the biggest single factor in deciding how far you can go in that respect. I think IPv6 is, is the big enabler. IPv6 technologies coming down through through high uh, bandwidth pipes, and how far down the network we can get that and maintain common security. If we have to change protocols, then there are always opportunities for security to break down. So for the next few years, we're, we're still looking at how to do subnets that meet power and pricing requirements. But I'd say the holy grail is for us to realize how to do IPv6 right down through the network to the edge node. Well, and Simon, you, um, ARM is developing a lot of different technologies. So this is a critical question to you. How open should platforms be and how pervasive should standards be? I think uh, standardization is really important ar around key technologies that everybody needs to use. Um, but I think, I think part, of, uh, part of developing those standards is making sure that um, people's interests get represented fairly and uh, you know, enough people get a voice at the table to drive the standards in the right direction. Um, and and this is a, you know there's a balance there you know if, if you know you ask a thousand people you get a thousand different opinions you're going to make progress but I think um, you know there are some good examples of the way standards bodies works <coughs> excuse me to to um, uh, d develop standards in a in a kind of sensible sensible uh, fashion um, so I think standardisation is very important um, although at the same time you know let's not standardise everything otherwise all solutions look the same what you what you're trying to uh, achieve is standardize the right things, standardize the things that absolutely have to be common um, and make sure there is plenty of space for people to innovate on top of them. Any comments on that, James? Yeah, I do. Uh, I, see, I think that's just absolutely essential, which is that uh, what, what, what Simon talked about is you have to have a process that involves all the stakeholders in making those standards. Um, it's, it's, the, the issue of standards is very specific. It's a local issue at, at every turn. And people have to make decisions about what things, almost what things at that moment need to be shared, and what things can be diverse, uh, and 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 work off of those shared those shared commonalities, and and the the problem with one player or a small number of players doing standards is that it's 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 easy to get that wrong. It's easy to get that wrong accidentally and and make things too rigid or 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 too open. People talk about the you know the. Uh, you know some other alternative uh, risk architectures and, uh, that were originally competitors to arms that were were in some sense left too open and so the community couldn't couldn't really coalesce around them and so it's a, it's a it's a delicate balance but but the way to get that right is you've got to put the stakeholders together who care about that balance and who are the ones that are going to be affected you know either way they may be shipping standard products and they need to be on one side of that standardization or they need to want to be able to build diverse products on it and um, uh, so it's it's that collective governance that I think is really cr uh, uh, crucial. I mean, if, I mean, if I look forward, one of the things that's really interesting about this, you know, this whole uh, I don't know connected community, is is how does it do governance? You know, how does it continue to get more and more sophisticated at at, at thinking through these issues? How you know how do how do you accelerate what Jeff's asking for, which is pushing IPv6 all the way down uh, to the end node? Uh, in a secure way. That's, you know, those are real challenges. They're real collective challenges. Um, but, but again, I'll go back. They're the same challenges that are there in healthcare, that are in energy, or that are in finance. You know, the same kind of thing. But time and time again, the, the standardization is the initial enabler that allows the growth of a network, and which then allows um, more proliferation, more, more end markets, more opportunities, and suddenly uh, a diversification again. And it's so and so forth. It just repeats. Okay. Well, you know, one of the biggest trends we have, especially in the semiconductor, well, I should say the high-tech industry right now, is vertical integration. You know, companies doing everything from silicon all the way to content services sometimes. You know, Apple being the prime example. Um, is vertical integration a threat or an enabler to this third-generation uh, ecosystem? I guess the way I see it is... Is neither really. Um, you know, well, one thing that um, you know we, we believe strongly in is not dictating the answer. So if people want to go off and try an approach to solving a problem, then let them go and do that. Um, you know, if you, if you dictate too much, then you, you end up with too too rigid an answer, and you get stuck in a local minima. Um, so I I don't know whether you know, massively open system vertical integration. 
or, or anything in between. You know, where is the right trade-off point? But uh, the last thing you want to do is inhibit people's choices about the way they put uh, products together and solutions together, because um, that just uh, just artificially limits innovation. So I don't think there is a right answer, and, and we'll just see what you know, which best products uh, win out at the end of the day. I'd like to make a quick comment on that. I think there's a uh, there's not one vertical integration. I think, I think sometimes the talk today is vertical integration versus network or versus ecosystem, and I think that's that's way too simple. Uh, the, um, the the model we see in, in Apple, some people have called virtual integration. It's not that Apple's making everything. Apple's making a tremendous number of make buy choices and is willing to move off of one supplier onto another, but it's 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 retaining intense design control. To, to be able to, to do, you know, particular very specific things with the end customers, and and it, as Simon says, that's an approach, and and it's it's an experiment to see how how that goes, how long that goes, you know, does it require a visionary like Steve Jobs to 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 generate enough value in the end to pay for that control, you know, but 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 it's not it's that's not just conventional vertical integration of 20 years ago. Same way with Samsung. I mean, I, I think you know people look at Samsung and they say, well, they've got all this capital investment in various parts of the value chain. Well, they do. But if you look closely at those companies, they often trade with other third parties. And and in many respects, they're in many respects, what I think Samsung is doing is not so much vertical integration as finding in a global super large system where are the places where they can put capital in the ground to serve these open systems all over the world, or, or, or mixed, open and closed, and uh, systems all over the world, but I, but I think this is sort of like the standards issue, only macro. Uh, we have to kind of see how these things play out. Uh, but but it, but it isn't that things are going to go to vertical integration or to completely broken down into networks. People are going to try to figure out, well, does this piece of the value chain need to be with this piece, or is it better to have this piece of the value chain separated, and then I can go off and get multiple suppliers or multiple approaches. You know, that's a it's it's an issue that continues to get worked out in an evolutionary way. No, I mean, from from our perspective, we uh, we also have to look at the this impact, the 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 massive growth of edge node, sensor driven data collection, and its connection into the enterprise and towards the world of big data. We have to think now about how we actually harness big data and the sensor, essentially at opposite ends of the network to create a local system for our customers. Uh, that again is working against vertical integration. Sounds like a million one different uh, solutions or options out there in the market. Um, but, but that's the point. <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well let's take it back to the companies that are you know, listening to this, viewing this. You know, how do they get started on this? And you know, so let's take it from both standpoints. Simon, what um, should a company trying to create this collaborative ecosystem, what partners should they look for? And, you know, like Freescale, you chose Freescale and you, you've got the largest probably open collaborative system in the technology industry. So what kind of, what are the attributes of the partners you look for, both in hardware and software and everything else? I mean, I think in, in generally how um, ARM's partnership network has, has evolved, um, Everyone's been been very clear about what their business model is. You know, uh, we we are creating technology components and we are licensing them to semiconductor companies, and they are building chips and and you know the and, and selling those chips to somebody else who's building an end product. And it's very clear that uh, the work we do um, isn't the same work as, as as what Jeff does, and it isn't the same as as the work that um, a, a real time operating system company does that creates some other piece of supporting technology. So you've got to be quite clear about um, how your business model works uh, and you've got, to be, you've got to be open about your information and I think take a, take a very open approach that um, you want your partners to be commercially successful and that commercial success will reinforce what you're doing. Um, it's very easy to get greedy and try and take too much of the pie or, or, or control the information flow. Uh, but for us, it was all about you know, just recognizing we couldn't do it even if we wanted to. Um, so let's be clear about what we're doing. Let's be clear about what uh, you know, we, we would like to see other people doing and try and facilitate that uh, so that ultimately um, somebody building a chip, somebody building a system can get their work done more efficiently. And that will fuel, um, that will fuel pr proliferation 
and grow the market so that it then attracts other people in. Uh, so, that, so this network effect, this kind of uh, building of uh, gravitational force is, is really important. So I think being clear about how your business works is very, very key. I think it's quite a, it's quite a unique model that, uh, that Arm has developed here, that uh, they can take into account the needs of uh, many strategic partners in, in very different market segments, as well as building one large coherent ecosystem that in its way supports nearly all of that, and at the same time balance the needs of Arm as a company to grow. So to, to manage those, those three things is quite a unique balancing act. So, I mean, Jeff, you just kind of said why. Why is Freescale attractive to ARM? I think because we, as I mentioned earlier, we, we can touch the edge node of Internet of Things, um, a huge quantity of very different end market applications. Um, what we haven't discussed so far is, is the amount of resource that, that we put into customer service and support in specific target market applications, you know, thousands and thousands of different end market applications, whether it's uh, an embedded MCU technology or an embedded processor or from the uh, uh, bus fabric. Again, the unique thing with, with uh, ARM is, is that we have this two-way dialogue in developing these technologies all the way from processor technology through fabric, through software, through multimedia. And, and I think it's it's that wide spectrum that hopefully uh, gives on, you know, the the feedback, the payback necessary to you know work with us so closely. Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. I mean, the, the the feedback is invaluable. You know, we we are trying to create technology that's useful in lots of different end markets, uh, but you know, we we are a, a we have a finite number of people with a finite amount of brain power, and we cannot know everything about every end market. Um, so, you know, the, the close working relationship we have with, with Freescale and with others it is absolutely vital to making sure that we get the product right. You know, we want our engineers now uh, to be building products that we will uh, see shipped in, in end products uh, many in many years time. And, um, you know, no one's crystal ball is perfect, so you've got to kind of triangulate many, many different points of view. So the input that we get from uh, from working with with Jeff and, and with others in in the, the partnership is absolutely vital for for steering what we do and you know, part of our part of our job and, and part of the work that uh, I and, and my colleagues do within Arm is just reinforcing to everyone you know listen you know we, we don't know everything that's going on on the planet go and talk to as many people as you can listen to ideas and then let's uh, kind of consolidate that down into a path a path forwards and then go and test that on our on our customers make sure we're going in the right direction and then go execute. I'd like to jump in on that if I could. It's, it's, as I see it, as I've studied these, what these people are doing, um, uh, the goal is, is diversity and the goal is, is touching uh, or creating many, many different solutions uh, out in the world and transforming the world. And so with that goal of, of, of um, of, of, of diversity at the edge, um, the the style is not one of control from the center. You know, the style has to be, I don't know what's out there, and so let me try to make kits that lower the barriers to entry. Let me try to put these things in the hands of anybody I can. You know, uh, I mean, you see that now with the homemade drones, right? People are taking essentially uh, kits of chips uh, that were developed for smartphones that have economies of scale and now using them to build homemade drones and a lot of other things where you see it in uh, in uh, uh, you know sort of the Raspberry Pi and the Arduino those kind of things and and my understanding is there's the next you know Simon talk about this but I, I just heard the other day about an effort to build a, a sort of a similar thing for the Internet of Things where where essentially hobbyists could build um, could 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 build solutions like apps okay that ran in little Internet of Things um, chips, which 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 uh, they can buy off the shelf, and then you know put into applications and connect up to big data. I, I forget, uh, Simon. You can it, it builds on your embed. Uh, right. Yeah, I was I was going to say you, you're probably re referring to to what's going on around embed right now, which uh, you know, yes. which Jeff, Jeff's a great partner on. As you say, you know we, we're trying to we're trying to fuel innovation by putting key building blocks in people's hands and then getting out of the way. 
and then you know letting people run wild with it and see where their imaginations take them and uh, you know through through the innovation that's out there through lowering the cost to, to people um, being able to get access to these technologies so they can go and play and they can just exploit their ideas um, great things come from it actually that's one thing I think the ARM ecosystem has done very well because a lot of the different processor vendors offer development boards and development platforms for really the hobbyists, as you put them, the innovators, really throughout the value chain. You know, one thing that we've talked about is, uh, you know, obviously there's this collaborative system, but there's also a competition within the system. So, you know, in ARM's case, it's kind of easy because they're kind of the center of this ecosystem. But what most people don't see is there's also, within this competition, there's also collaboration. So, I mean, you know, can can we share with some of the participants here really what that collaboration looks like, even when a company is a competitor? Jeff, you got an example of that with maybe some of your competition out there? Um, I think in the embed space, um, it's uh, the the benefit of embed is the number of projects that are posted online. And it doesn't really matter what the uh, particular silicon um, platform is there. What, what matters is the ease with which new beginners there can just access modules that, that take you into connectivity, that take you into working with sensors and getting you working on the actual end application as fast as possible. And that's just creating more users and uh, more development engineers and hopefully more uh, students and uh, uh, graduates going into the embedded industry. So, you know, thinking about our future needs in terms of engineering talent, that's actually one of the better collaborations. Yeah, I, I think uh, another great example is around uh, software development. Uh, so a few years ago, um, as we went around and talked to our partners about um, about Linux, particularly as, as the open source solution became so popular um, in all sorts of electronics, um, we, we'd go and have conversations where, where people would say, oh, you know, I've, I've just optimized Linux kernel XYZ for ARM processor version A, um, and you'd have exactly the same conversation three days later with, a, with another licensee. And we think, well, hang on, this is, this is a complete waste of time. Um, you know, let's do it once and do it once properly. Uh, and that led to the creation of an organization called Lanaro, where um, people uh, across the partnership contribute resources, they contribute engineering time, um, and focus on big projects which are going to benefit everyone. And you know, Freescale was, was a, a founder member of that. Um, it's a great example where there's a common problem, um, everyone's prepared to share the cost of solving it, and then share the benefit of the work that comes out at the end of the day. It, it, it's fantastic. So. If we look at this and you're really trying to foster that innovation, you know, a lot of it seems to be around solving problems uh, or sharing costs. Are there any other keys to, you know, and this is really a good question for you, James, you know, to really help foster that innovation no matter what the industry is? Are there really key tools or key solutions or key aspects you should look at to try to foster that innovation? Yeah, I think it, it, it comes down to the soft cultural things. Uh, it, it, it comes down to trust. It comes down to a, a track record of not uh, not doing each other in. Uh, I, mean, I mean, you can look at these wonderful social psychology studies of the proliferation of either trust or of mistrust. And, uh, you know, these things are vicious cycles to the mistrust side and virtuous cycles to the trust side. And, I, I, you know, I think I think what you, what you have to work on all the time is this trust, is this this getting it fair, understanding that yes, we're all competing very, very hard, uh, and and that's in fact the engine of a big engine of creativity here. But we're also we, we also you know are, are collaborating and and we're doing both. And you know, for me, I, I'm a sports buff, a professional sports buff, and I like listening to, bizarrely maybe I like listening to sports talk radio. And um, you know, the the thing in professional sports that I find one of the things I find so interesting is that these are leagues. And the leagues are cooperative leagues. I mean, and, and you can destroy a sport by by letting the large market teams uh, run all over the small market teams. And then you've got to come back and figure out, okay, what's the balance? You know, how do we do salary caps? How do we, you know, how do how do we kind of get this right to make the sport grow? Uh, and um, I think you know that's, you know, 
it's a similar kind of thing here. And it's, I did find it amazing how many of the people running these companies in the Army know each other. A lot of them grew up together. Uh, I think that helps them. Uh, I think one one of the um, interesting things that I've been involved with in arm in, in recent years is the uh, the development of arm's smallest uh, processor core in the market, hmm. um, and the certain knowledge that promoting that and bringing that to the market, along with some of our competitors, is going to replace many of our own individual proprietary entry level products. And to to actually start off and do that, knowing that that would be the outcome, is uh, it's, I think, a testament to the fact that ultimately the collaborative market is going to benefit us more than hanging on to that proprietary model. Yeah, it's another one of those examples of, it seems like an odd thing to do, but it ultimately leads to a, a larger pie to, to go and take business from because of the, the efficiencies that come from it. And uh, you know, you, the, the, the input that uh, your team gave me to that, uh, Jeff, was uh, invaluable. You know, you, you mentioned being willing to cannibalize your own proprietary technology. You know, that's a real challenge, especially for these old monopolies that, you know, once they get so big, they really try to protect that long-term investment. You know, uh, the Wintel model kind of comes to mind here. Um, you know, that's, that, that's a real challenge. <laughs> I see that as a huge challenge going forward, trying to, trying to convince people. So, I mean... But, 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 but the thing that convinces them is the results now. I mean, we're in a different world, right? I mean, you know, 5, 10, 15 years ago, maybe you could run a business like that for a long time. But the, 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 the effects that, 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 that both Jeff and Simon are talking about, the accelerated innovation, that's here now. It's not going to go away. So um, I, I really think that these traditional business models, they're on their way out. And, you know, in, in, in various sectors, you know, there isn't one yet. It's kind of like being a department store versus Walmart. Okay. You know, it, it's, it, you know, ultimately Walmart, except in niches, is, it, you know, wins. It's, it's, the, it's the low cost. In that case, it's a closed network, but it's very much a network model. So I, th I think that we, the, the bigger pie model is here. I mean, I think that's the, and, and convincing, you've only got to look at Intel. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, seriously, if you bought Intel stock 10 years ago, it hasn't done very well. And, and if you look at what they're struggling with now, yes, they have a lot of dollars, they have a lot of people. Uh, you know, how well are they doing? Well, the end customers, uh, you know, are, are dissatisfied. Uh, they're extraordinarily dependent still on Microsoft's operating systems. The Microsoft operating system, because it's dominant, uh, if they get it wrong, uh, you know, causes the whole, the whole pie to shrink. Uh, so I don't know. I, mean, I, I think, yes, it takes a lot of bureaucratic convincing inside of a big traditional company right now. But I think if you're looking in from the outside, it's, it's, um, it's not a convincing job. It's, 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 it's those who want to be in that model, fine. You know, it's kind of, you know, the uh, Cocos thing, if you can get a better car, get it. But, but I think the better cars now are these new kind of cars. And, um, and, you know, that's where I'd rather be. I'd rather be with Tesla than be with General Motors right now. Well, this sounds like a generational thing. I mean, not only in terms of people running hmm. these companies, yeah. but companies themselves. So, I mean, is this the end game or, you know, does this continue to evolve? This is, uh, especially for you, Simon, if we look at this, you know, is there something you'd like to see change or evolve in the business models even further going forward? Um, well, that's hard to say really. I mean, I think uh, rapid innovation is, is here and, and this is the way the world is going to work. Uh, you know, if you've got a really strong incumbent position, status quo is great. But I think uh, smart people realize that you can't hang on to something like that forever. And if you don't keep innovating, then someone's, somebody else is going to come up with, with a better solution. So yeah, we, we get questions all the time about how the semiconductor industry is maturing and are there companies that are too big. And yeah, you know, I just sort of look at the way that um, the big names have changed over the years. I, I, I really don't see that, that, uh, that situation changing very much. Um, the, the, the demand for semiconductors is only going up. Uh, the, the ease of innovation is improving all the time. Some of the, the big issues that required just massive scale in the past um, have, have been addressed. You know, chip manufacturing, you can go to a foundry and, and get a chip manufactured without having to build your own factory. Um, you know, a lot of the software has been taken care of through open source. You sort of, so some of these kind of um, uh, structural issues that prevented innovation have been removed and now you can spend your time 
yeah. really concentrating on something that is truly innovative. And you know that that's the way of the world now. And, and we will see more innovation. We'll see it in products. We'll see it in in uh, component technologies. Um, and I'm sure we'll see it in business models as well. Yeah. Any comments on that? Well, I, yeah, I, I think I, I'm, um, but what Simon just said about structural, the structural barriers to innovation are being, you know, those things are, those, those problems are being solved. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're building, if you will, alternative structure, alternative uh, biomass or, you know, alternative business mass uh, that, that allows for this, you know, very low barriers to entry in many, many parts of the, of the business value chain. Uh, and then lots of new entrants and, and this continual growth cycle. Um, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to, I, I, I'm sitting here taking notes saying, you know, that's, that's how I want to say it. I think Simon's got it right. It's, it's there, we've got to look at the structural barriers to, to innovation in various industries. And, and, you know, collectively, a bunch of people have done that in the semiconductor business and all the things it touches. But if you go back to these other things like energy or healthcare or education, uh, they've all got a lot of structural barriers to innovation as well. And uh, you know, I don't know what the equivalent of a of a free open foundry is, or a or a you know a collective software pro project is in, in in those other industries. But I, but I think that's important. And I and I think once you start to make those structural changes, you you get a kind of a one way change in which new kinds of open business models are you know, just more and more interesting business models uh, can succeed, and the traditional ones will have, you know, will have difficulty hanging on. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more, um, James. You know, when you say that uh, education, energy, and healthcare have structural barriers, they have a big mm -hmm. one. The government. Yeah. yeah. I certainly see the uh, the rate of innovation increasing. If anything, uh, ironically, just as we say that uh, there's a, an open arm ecosystem. The diversity of processor cores matching every power and performance uh, um, level and scale level um, has just increased massively just in the last two, three years. It, it's led to us now looking at innovation from the point of view of how do we combine those very dissimilar cores uh, in terms of scale and size yeah. to solve one large scale system problem and to get the best power um, benefit to the end user from, from how to do that. It's no longer about what do you do within a single core. It's how we combine those cores in the system that will really give the characteristics of the system we built. Okay, gentlemen, I'm going to ask you as one final question to pull out your crystal balls. You know, you've all talked about <laughs> really structures of innovation and and really fostering innovation going forward. Okay, let's look at you know what do you see are major changes or challenges in the industry, especially the high tech industry over the next five to ten years and how should the industry work together in this collaborative environment to solve those issues? Jeff? Well I, I touched on it earlier I, I think um, from the human resource um, aspect just bringing in enough experienced programmers, uh, software and systems people to work on the Internet of Things in the next two three years is uh, a major um, undertaking and requires that we dramatically expand uh, our role and engagement with universities, uh, college hiring, and just generally sponsoring a, as much internship in the, in the software areas as possible. Investment in the future, huh? Yeah. Especially the, especially the people. What yes. about you? I, I, I think um, as a general trend that's, uh, that's just hard to deal with is complexity. Um, the, as much as, as a lot of the, the kind of building blocks and the, the collaboration you know, do solve common problems, um, ultimately the systems that people are putting together nowadays are amazingly complex and uh, verification of design, um, verification of physical issues as you go to, to actually manufacture a chip, you know, these are hard problems and they're getting harder. So, you know, as a, as a, as a challenge in an area that uh, I, I think the industry needs to work on an address is just managing complexity uh, and, it, and it affects software, it affects hardware design, it affects manufacturing. Um, it, all, all parts of the chain really uh, get, get impacted by just the increase in complexity. James? Yeah, I think uh, the reason I called the book Shared Purpose uh, was that I, I, I think that the challenge going forth for all of us 
is how do we work together on the planet to, to tackle a bunch of these, these big common challenges. And, and to me, it's very much a human resources problem. It, it is very much a, 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 a educating people, um, educating people to a style of collaborative work, educating people in, um, in, in science and also in the humanities. It's, it's, it's being able to find at the edge of this whole in technology, at the edge of technology, it's where all the action is. It's where the real solutions are, where the applications are. It's, it's so how, how do you find ways to, to, to just, just bring more and more people together in knowledgeable, collaborative ways to solve these problems? And, and one of the things I'm excited about is that, that the, these kind of more open models, they, they, they do bring education forward. I mean, they, they do educate people. And, and the fact that they have low barriers to entry and they're inclusive, uh, allows them to bring a lot more people. We, I, there's a project going on in India right now that uh, Sam Petroda and others are doing uh, to 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 build a whole new semiconductor industry in India using their you know 500,000 engineers, and um, you know you know that's huge. But I but I think that sort of educating of the planet um, c comes from this kind of industry and uh, is a result of it. But and also obviously is what feeds it and, and lets it keep growing. Well, thank you. I want to remind everyone um, that uh, if you want to ask any questions, you can probably still do that on Twitter uh, later on, and we'll try to answer them. That's at uh, hashtag arm shared purpose. Um, this information will be available, I believe, uh, not only on the ARM website, but also on YouTube. Uh, that information will probably be sent out here shortly. Um, so it's all recorded. And I want to thank again Jeff, James, and Simon for your participation. If anyone has uh, any other uh, questions or recommendations for future topics for me or this panel, go ahead and contact me at jim at curiousresearch.com. And I want to thank everyone, everyone once again for joining us today. And uh, thank you for the great conversations, gentlemen. Thank great. you, Jim. You're thanks, Jim. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Good job. Thanks, everybody.